Well, I want to welcome you back to week two of a series that we started last weekend. We're calling it Faithful. Now, we know how to spell, so I understand that the biblical word that is an attribute of God is spelled with one L, but using a play on words just to get us thinking a little bit about the fact that we are entering a season where our worlds are about to get full. Your calendar is about to get full. You're gonna have parties and activities and family events. The roads are going to get more and more full. Just a little coaching from your pastor. The inside lane is for passing. Get out of our way, okay? We got a place to be, okay? We're gonna get full of food. Everybody excited about that? Come on now. Let's get prepared, because we're gonna get full, all right? We're gonna have a lot of things going on, and yet, this time of year tends to be a time when people are more depressed, more stressed, more anxious, challenges with family, and so going into this season, and really for our whole lives, here's what I've learned in my own life, this is what I've learned in sharing and working with people for many years, we can't ever be too full of biblical faith. You can't ever be too full of that. And you don't just get it anywhere. And in fact, it's in short supply sometimes in our lives. And so yet it is so vital and so necessary. And when we get close to God and we get close to his word, we find that he has this faith available for us. And so I'm gonna ask you here in week two, we're gonna do two more weeks of this series. And we're going to look back as we're looking at one chapter of the Bible and the characters in it. I'm gonna ask you if you would to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We're gonna start in verse one and then the character we're gonna discuss this week is Hebrews 11, 22. I wanna welcome those watching online or maybe someone who may watch this uh, message later, those as well at 1230 making room and making space for others. I want, I want to celebrate something with you. It's significant, it's massive for the individual, and it's also like an injection of faith into our church family, and that is this weekend we had a great opportunity for many of you to go through Freedom Weekend. Come on. How many of y'all out there went through Freedom Weekend? Yeah. Yeah. And I know those of you that went through it, you're excited and you're excited for a reason. Because this freedom journey, it has a small group component where you make relationships with others. You begin to see what's available for you. See, a lot of people think you just have to go through life carrying all the trash and the garbage of your past and your parents and your family and all the stuff that's happened to you. But the Bible tells us that for freedom, Christ set us free. And there's a freedom available. And so I'm so excited about all of you that went through this weekend. In a little over a two-year period, we've had 1,500 people go through the freedom journey. And every single one of those people now are ready and more prepared to walk out the call that God has on their lives. And for all of those people going through it, it's not possible except for probably over 500. I know there's a few hundred of you this weekend that served others. Thank you to all the freedom small group leaders. Thank you to all those that gave up all those times through small groups of serving others. And then on a weekend like this, I slip in every now and then into the ministry times. And man, it is so rich, it is so powerful. And all of you freedom leaders, I wanna tell you, we can't do it without you. It it takes teams to win championships. So I just wanna thank you for all of you that serve others to help them walk out the call of God. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Amazing, amazing. Hebrews 11.1 has at the start of it an introduction that tells us about the topic that we're talking about, about how we can be more full of biblical faith. Hebrews 11.1 tells us about faith because for a lot of people they're like, I need more of that, like what is it? How do I get it? What would that even look like? And it tells us here in Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is confidence. Faith is confidence. I find a lot of people are looking to make more confident decisions with their children, more confident decisions in life. How do I know what God's saying? How do I know God's will? It says here that when you put your faith in God, faith starts with God. It starts with him, but then it involves us. 
So faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see in the natural realm. So if you don't have biblical faith, you're led by your feelings. Most people today, if you ask them, how do, how do you decide? Well, I just do what I feel. That's a terrible guide. That's terrible. No, 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 you can have confidence. You can have assurance. Now, it's not in something necessarily that's in the tangible realm. This is what the ancients were commended for. And you say, who are the ancients? Well, a lot of times this, this little chapter here is affectionately called the Hall of Fame of Faith. Because there are these heroes in here, there are these champions in here, there are those that are rooting us on in here that are they're talking to us about their lives and saying, look, we lived real lives too, and I want you to be able to understand some of the things that we walk through. The Holy Spirit uses them as examples to help us in our journey of faith. Now, now here's the thing is we're learning about faith in this series that you need to understand because you're like, look, I want more confidence. I want more assurance. I want more hope. We learned last week that it's impossible to please God without biblical faith. So you're like, look, I want to please God. I want more of that. Like, where do you get it? How do you get it? There's a problem in our culture today that a lot of times we're not as prepared for the challenges we're not as prepared for the moments because faith doesn't work like our current culture. Faith doesn't work like the way we live. Today, we have a high priority on convenience. I like convenience. It's like getting out of control though, let's be honest. At some point, we will just like have, have everything done for us at some point, right? Amazon is looking so they can have a drone drop our food off, right? Maybe they'll invent a robot to cook it and then they can feed us. I mean, you, you, there's, there's, there's different things I saw where there's, they're, they're making and designing things that'll make your bed for you. They have a cup now, this is real, a cup to keep your coffee heated. We're too lazy to stir it. No problem. It'll stir it for you. One of our young guys on the team, I said, have y'all heard about this? He goes, look, pastor, don't knock it. I'm really into it. I mean, I, I like that thing, okay? I have two girls in my house this week, of course, and they said, dad, can we get Disney Plus? Everything's plus, Amazon Plus. We need plus the convenience. We need plus the stuff streamed to us. Can we get Disney Plus? So we can get 500 Disney movies and 7,500 Disney shows. Let's not. <laughs> you guys absorb my television enough. Do you think I'm gonna empower you with that? We'll just stream it into our world. Convenience. Here's something that happens at my house. This, this did not happen at the house I grew up in. In my house, we huddle up. What are we going to do for dinner? You know, mom's been busy. This, come on now, what are, we going, what are we going to do for dinner? You know, got one kid going to swim, another kid going to cheer, got this going on. And my kids, they have a line that I never had. Let's door dash. <laughs> Let's dash it to us. Dash it on over here. My mom was slaving over the stove cooking for two hours and the door dash looked like Jeff go to the neighbors and dash me a cup of sugar to make the dessert. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But now we just dash it over to us. It's all good, I guess, until we become basically useless, I don't know. It's all fine. Here's the problem. You don't door dash biblical faith. You gotta do the hard work. You don't door dash, you don't stream confidence, assurance, hope. You don't stream it, you don't stream it. It doesn't happen overnight. There's a development process and the reason this chapter's in the Bible is to show us these people. Now by the way, we tend to over-personalize our own problems and challenges. I'm the only person facing these struggles. I'm the only person, I've been dealt a bad hand. No, these people here show us their real lives, their challenges, their circumstances to show us, no, they had those too, 
but they had biblical faith in God, not themselves. And so we find ourselves needing Hebrews 12, 1. We learned last week that 12, 1 there frames all of Hebrews 11. Therefore, because of these ancients that understood faith, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, you may have never thought about that. You may feel like there's no one there to encourage you. You may feel like I have to encourage myself all the time. By the way, we can never get enough encouragement, can we? We just need it for our souls. It's like breath to us. It's like life to us. Here's something you may never think about. Every now and then when you just think, man, I need some encouragement. Know this, there's a crowd of witnesses in the stands of heaven. And they're saying, you got this. You got this. Okay, you can do this. You can finish. And so there's all of those crowd of witnesses, but another thought too is we've got Sunday school teachers and parents and mentors and coaches and teachers that have gone on to heaven. As I stood over my dad there as he was giving uh, in his final moments, I told you the story last week, I had kind of a a, a surreal moment because I was in his home and he was there on hospice and I looked at a picture right there on the wall and I thought, my dad's about to pass away This is a real weird feeling, guys, when you get this place in life. In the picture was my dad, my uncle, my grandmother, another one of my uncles. There was one other of one of my cousins. And I thought, everyone in the picture is going to be in those stands. Every one of them. There's more people. The older you get, get this, there's more people in the stands of heaven than there are here running the race with us. So there's this crowd of witnesses. What are they saying to us? They're talking to us about this life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. So what are they saying to us? We can finish our race, we can run our race, We can get past the things that you're stuck in. You can get past the barriers that are holding you back. You can move forward toward the purpose and the plan that God has for your life. And so we're gonna look at one of those ancients and we're gonna ask one of those heroes. I want you to think about it this way. We're gonna ask one of those heroes in the stands and we're running our race. We're gonna ask Joseph to come out of the stands. Quite a powerful thought. Joseph, through God's word, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, come run with us here for a lap. Talk to us. Tell us a little bit about what your journey was like. Tell us how you made it. How'd you finish your race? Hebrews eleven twenty two. And I mean, I, I had a new insight this week into this. This is what's powerful. If you're just starting out in the Bible or you've been reading it forever, it's so powerful because it's living and active. And I was amazed by what Hebrews 11 says about this hero, Joseph. Hebrews eleven twenty two. it could have highlighted multiple things about this guy. By the way, he's one of the largest stories in the Bible from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50. We have more of this snapshot of his life. It's like an, a, a wild action movie, you know, like a, like, a, like a wild movie that's on multiple sets and multiple locations and geography and situations. And Hebrews 11 could have highlighted any area of his journey and his story. Look what it highlights in Hebrews 11:22. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, by faith at the end of his life, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. That's a big moment in the timeline of God. God's people are in bondage, God's people are in tyranny, and you may know the story, you may not, but God sends Moses to be the deliverer. It was a marking moment. It was a type and a shadow of the deliverer, Jesus Christ. It led to the Passover, the symbolism that we find when we understand the life of Jesus. It was huge, it was massive, it's still celebrated today by the Jewish people. And so he says this regarding that exodus from the Israelites from Egypt, And he said this, he gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. When I read that this week, I thought, I need to know like why that's a faith statement. When you read the Bible, you need to go, now why is the Bible making a big deal out of this? And so I just, so we did a little research and just thought, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, how long until Moses? When he says this, 
It's 300 years until the birth of Moses, and then Moses is 80 years old when he takes on the task to go back and go to Pharaoh and deliver the people. So get this, now this is powerful. This is mind blowing. My, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not my thoughts, says God. He has the ability to expand your understanding of how great he is. And every time you get close to him, he expands your whole thought process about how awesome and mighty and powerful our God is. Listen to this mind-expanding, spirit-strengthening faith statement. Look at this. 400 years, he looks out into the future and says, when you go into that promise, land, when you leave Egypt, take my bones, take my bones. Faith looks out into the future, even 400 years out of Joseph's life. Now some of you are like, man, you keep talking about this guy, Joseph. I've heard a little bit about his story. Again, he's one of the big main characters of the Bible, his story that people may know some things about, but just to refresh some of you, or maybe to tell some of you for the first time the story, let me tell you about this guy, Joseph, because that was at the end of his life, but let's look at his life, let's let him run with us a little bit, and let's see about what happens in his story. Well, he's, he's favored. He's a favored guy. His dad has special favor toward him, this young, young one of the other brothers. He's got a bunch of brothers and he gets a special code and he's favored by God. By the way, I find people get in a ditch regarding this today. Like people have trouble talking about the favor of God or the hand of God or the blessing of God. It's all the way through the Bible. But sometimes people that way are afraid of it because they're like, well, wait a minute, you know, like we don't want to manipulate God, true. We don't want to make it like God just blesses everything. I agree. In fact, if you're under the favor of God, then you also need to be preparing for the challenges that are in your future. But the truth is, if you're challenged in your world today, you might also need to understand about the favor of God. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. They're both part of the story of God in our lives. When we read about these heroes of faith, God's hand was on their lives. And I believe where we're positioned today, we can still believe that God wants to put his hand on our lives. Is it all God or is it all us? It's both. God, God favored him. His father favored him, but he was a young guy. Let's give him some grace. Not a lot of self-awareness. He comes to his brothers. I don't know how many of y'all grew up in a home with brothers, okay? You know what I'm saying? Look, a little competitive touch up in there. And he comes out, hey, y'all hey, like my coat? Uh, I just want y'all to know one day you're gonna bow down to me. <laughs> Didn't go so good. By the way, just a little thought. Your dream, see he had a dream from God and it was a God dream. Your dream may not be able to be shared with everybody. But how you share your dream is important as well. So he shares that with his brothers and they get dishonored in it. They feel disrespected. So they start devising plans to deal with him. They throw him in a pit. They ultimately sell him into slavery. But because God's hands on his life, because he's walking with God, because he's got the character of God, he ends up ending up into the home of Potiphar. You say, who's Potiphar? Well, he's a high-ranking Egyptian official. And because of the excellence on his life, because of the character of God on his life, he ends up excelling in that environment and he ends up having a lot of influence and ruling over things. The only problem is now he ends up in a different test. In this test, this high-ranking official, Potiphar's wife, makes a sexual advance toward him. She comes on to him and moves toward him, but he runs from the situation. She feels rejected, so she decides to make a big deal and falsely accuses him to her husband, and then he ends up in prison. But because God's hand's on his life, because the faith of God's on his life, because the character of God's on his life, he ends up getting promoted and running the prison for the warden, and again, he's mistreated again in that situation, but he, he hears from God and he's able to interpret dreams, and so Pharaoh starts having some dreams, and he has a particular dream 
about an economic condition of the world and about seven years of famine and seven years he has this, this picture of some cows and seven years of abundance and so they go looking for this guy who's been interpreting dreams and Joseph is able to interpret the dream to Pharaoh and once again he ends up getting promoted and he's part of the executing person that helps deal with the fact that they need to prepare for these times of famine. Well, because they prepared for the times of famine, back home in the homeland, his brothers and his family are starving because there's a famine and they have no food. So they end up going to Egypt to find food and they do not even realize when they come before this high-ranking official looking for food, it's Joseph. And they bow their knee. Dream fulfilled. Dream fulfilled, but a lot of ups and downs along the way. Genesis 50, though, says this, verse 19, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I'm in the place of God. You intended to harm me, but look at this. This is really good theology. This is really good help you. This is really good will help you in life. But God intended it for good. You did intend to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. Have you ever thought about this, the ups and downs in your journey, the things you're going through now? You can't door dash what you're getting, but you just begin to get a perspective. Wait a minute, they're meaning it for bad, but God's working, and I'm gonna be a person of character, and I'm gonna be a person who continues in my journey with God, and God will actually take all of that. When you walk with God a little while, you look back and go, well, he even used that, because he's a good God. Boy, he used that. How could he make good out of that? He used that. Saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured them, and this is probably not something he could do early in his journey, but as he developed biblical faith and God was changing who he really was, look what it says here. And he spoke kindly to them. It's really amazing to me. He spoke kindly to them. And then Joseph said to his brothers, look at this, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. What does Joseph say to us? What does he say to us in our lap? He's saying this, look, you can finish your race and you can even run your race despite the obstacles, despite the challenges, despite the stuff that you're going through, you can run your race even as you get to the end of the race, you can make a deposit that carries on even after you're gone with your race, if you have biblical faith. And so it's all about how are you running your race? Are you running it with endurance? Are you running it in such a way that you can finish your race? Here I am talking about running races. You're looking at me thinking, you know, you don't really have the physical stature of a runner. I never really have. I played offensive line. I was the big kid. I was the kid you didn't want to sit by at lunch because I was going to try to get some of your food. I didn't get involved in running sports. I, was ne I didn't make the track team except to throw the shot put. Come on, just give it up for the shot put people. They're the big guys over there that never get on the track, okay? So that was me. In fact, I was in PE one time. I had the Levi's 501s. Come on, people of the 80s. Sitting over there at PE, I saw the hurdle. I saw these people that would jump over it like gazelles. I thought, I want to try that. There was all my friends sitting there. Had a little sag going on. You know what I'm saying? Big kid burning diesel. He goes over there. I jumped to try to get over the hurdle. Ripped my pants all the way up. All my friends were looking. So several years ago, my sister, she said, big brother, I want you to run a half marathon with me. So big men don't run marathons. Uh, so I did do it though, because you can't say no to your sister about anything. So I did it, I trained and had this experience and I'll just tell you about my experience, okay? I learned something about running races. Because I trained real hard and honestly I was really scared, can I finish? And I just kind of stayed real focused, you know, I was not real friendly by the way, I was just real focused. Some people are out there just running, I'm like, huh. Just trying to finish, man, just trying to finish, you know. But I got toward the end and I thought I had calculated, because I didn't have all these special running things, I thought I had calculated the finish line by way of I was running in my hometown, so I knew the roads and I thought where they had the finish line, I thought I had it calculated. And so I got toward what I thought was the end and I got in pride. 
I started seeing people that I didn't believe should beat me. And I just saw, they're not even a runner. They're not even an athlete. I'm gonna catch them. I know it's flesh. I'm sorry, it's just the way, the way it is. And I'm just like, I'm beating them. I'm beating, oh, oh, I'm beating him. Are you joking me? I'm beating you. Passing up, folk. Only problem was the last part of the race was uphill that I didn't calculate. And so on the last part of the race, I'm out of gas. And now it's doing the, what I call the big man shuffle. <sighs> And like 70-year-old ladies are passing me. All those people I passed. There was a brother like, hey, brother. Ah, you know. Here's what I learned. You can't run somebody else's race. In our world today, we lack faith because we're absorbed with everybody else's race. We're absorbed with who's getting away with what in their race and when are they going to finish and what's their time. If you want to be a person who develops biblical faith, get serious about your own race. Get serious about your own faith. Get serious about your own development, your own process. And when you get serious about that, God starts depositing faith in your life. You can receive a deposit of biblical faith. And we're going to answer this question in our last few moments together. How can I have faith like Joseph? Last week we talked about how do we have faith like Noah because all of their stories have some things. They seem so out of the box, but there's some practicals that we can do, okay? There's some practicals. How do we have faith like Joseph? Now I want to qualify every week that Joseph would say to us that he is looking out into the future to the promise of God, so he would say to us, you're at a greater advantage than me. Because now we live on the backside of the fulfillment of the promise that Joseph looked to. So now we have a debt we could never pay, a God we could never earn favor with, and we have the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus dies on the cross to make a payment we could never make so that we can have free access to God. Jesus is an alive Jesus today, and the same power that raised him from the dead can live on the inside of us. We have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to guide us, to comfort us, to help us. We have this written word as a guide to us. So you say, how do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. People say, man, how do I have confidence? You're only gonna have confidence in the promises of God, not your feelings. So Joseph would say, first of all, you have a better chance. That's amazing to think. But here's the first thing he would tell us. You learn how to trust God to promote you. We live in a self-promoting culture today. We think, man, I've got to promote myself. And Joseph shows us that he has a young guy, we have grace for him. He thought promoting and sharing, he thought that, but what we really see is, despite the worst obstacles, let's not, let's not sanitize this story. There's betrayal by your brothers, the people that, you should, that should love you. There, there's like, false accusation. Anybody in here hate being accused of something you didn't do? Like there's everything in his story that we hate. Having our family turn against us, having false accusation, the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. The Holy Spirit will always talk to you about you. The devil will always talk to you about somebody else. He's the accuser of the brethren. So there's false accusation. There's all this stuff that he's enduring, and what do we learn from his story? God's big enough. God's big enough, pit, slavery, false accusations, God's big enough. Why, how do you apply that in your life? When you understand, here's how you get faith, okay? I'm gonna develop my character, I'm gonna develop in my life a, a, a relationship with God where he's smiling, where he's looking to and fro across the whole earth who he can show himself strong on someone's behalf. I'm gonna build that and God will do the promoting. And when you really understand, your boss is not your promoter. Promotion does not come from the east or the west, Promotion comes from the hand of God. So God does the promoting, we do the developing, we do the character work, we do the word, we do that part, God does the promoting. And when you feel like you have to self-promote, here's what happens. You have to self-promote, all that does is increase anxiety. Because the quickest way to have more anxiety in your life is take control of your destiny. 
The more you take control of it, the less you're trusting God, which puts you in the place of God, which is why our world is filled with anxiety today, because we think we have to promote ourselves to our next step in our destiny. But if we would do the work of just being people of character, have the hand of God on our life, then God would do the promoting along the way. By the way, too, Joseph didn't have a lot of self-awareness. Hey, guys, you're going to bow down to me. No, we're not. When you're a self-promoter, we all have a little bit of it in us, you, you mess up relationships. And by the way, everybody else can see it on you. It's why you need good friends around you. It's a good question to ask. Do I come off as self-promotional or do I come off as someone who's trying to serve others, help others, you know, live under the hand of God, character? It's a good, it's a dangerous question to ask, but it's a good one to ask. Because if you're a self-promoter, everybody kind of starts going. But you can't see it. And the only problem we have today is technology publicizes your dysfunction to everybody. And everybody's like, Bleh. but they don't want to unfollow you because then you would take that as rejection and then there would be a big problem. Anyway, let's just not get into all that. <laughs> Number two, you run from temptation. That's what Joseph did. He ran from temptation and you can do that. You say, I want to build my faith. Well, the more you run from temptation, the more you set yourself up for God's character and God's hand upon your life. He ran from it. When this advance came, he didn't entertain it. He didn't try to talk himself out of it. He didn't try to talk her out of it. He just ran. And so you just, you run from temptation in our lives. You say, man, I got this strong thing there. It's like, how is it even possible for me to overcome that? Well, you might need to know this about Joseph because you want to know where was his power to run from that kind of temptation? This is very important. This is not willpower. This is not self-help. Joseph, if you read the story, it says, I didn't want to sin against God. I didn't want to sin against God. Condemnation is, okay, you're making mistakes and it's about you and you're defined by that, but the healthy conviction and nudging and the desire to walk with God and the nudging of the Holy Spirit is a holy and a healthy thing and it'll protect you from so many problems. I have a lot of young people around my life raising kids and different things. The favorite phrase of today's world, don't judge me. No, 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 I'm gonna tell you about this right now, but just, just don't judge me. Can I encourage everybody with this? You don't have to worry about anybody's judgment as long as you're allowing the Holy Spirit in this word right here to judge you all the time. So what we're saying is, look, I don't wanna have any of the convictions that God said should be standards in my life, but I wanna be excused by saying, don't judge me, and that's a long message, and I don't have time, and don't email me, but I am gonna do a series on it. God bless all of you. But, but, but in all seriousness today, the word don't judge me is not an excuse to say that I don't want to sin against God. I don't want to sin against God. So I had a young girl this week ask me, say, does, are you talking about absence at one of our services afterwards in the comments? She goes, are you talking about absence? I'm like, well, that's a great target because the Bible says that sexual immorality is anything that happens sexually outside the confines of a man and woman in holy matrimony. So if you have that as a standard, you're in line with God's will and you can have confidence that he wants you to have faith to have that. But I will tell you this, running from temptation is not just running from it in the moment, but running from temptation is actually preparing yourself by not putting yourself in situations that could increase what you're trying not to do and have faith for. So, so if you say, well, we want to be holy till we get married, but we're going to live together, which I've, I'm a pastor, I've had people for years say, we live together, but we don't do anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't put yourself in the spot. Ah! I'm running from that. I'm running from it. I'm going to put guards on my devices. I'm not going to talk on Facebook to old friends when I'm married. I'm not going to do that on Instant Messenger to strum up something that could lead to a temptation that could cause me to violate my standards and sin against God. The third thing is you forgive even the greatest of offenses. You forgive even the greatest of offenses and I gotta tell you, 
It's mind blowing that Joseph would talk to them kindly, that he would forgive them, that he would not only forgive them, but he would help them. It's mind blowing. And, and I wanna say as a pastor, one of the biggest faith robbers that the enemy wants to get lodged in your soul is unforgiveness. I, I, I only can attribute it to the hand of God, the favor of God, the character on Joseph's life, but how he walked through all of those things and just kind of kept walking toward and running toward, if he were to get right beside us, he would go, how, how do you get over getting thrown in a pit? You gotta forgive. How do you get falsely accused? You gotta forgive. How, how, do, you, how do you forgive? Because unforgiveness will lodge itself in your soul. And what's so crazy about it is, you think that it's about those people, but it's always about God saying, hey, here's what I wanna do in you. A few years ago, I had a, a challenging situation where there's a very troubled person who was saying some really challenging things to me. I didn't even really have anything to do with it. And I mean, they were cursing my family, doing it, and the Holy Spirit in the middle of it, this isn't me, the Holy Spirit in the middle of it said, Jeff, just smile, just love. It's not about you, it's not about them, it's about what I wanna do in you. And we're not making light of the fact you may have, it's, the Bible doesn't make light of the fact that they did unjustly accuse him. They did throw him in the pit, they did do wrong. We're not making light of the wrong, but what we're saying for our own soul and the faith that we need, we're gonna ask God to help us forgive. What's Joseph say to us? Wherever you are, you can finish your race. Wherever you're stuck at, you can finish your race. Wherever you're at in the story, you can finish your race with God's help, with the faith that can only come from God that is supernatural and outside of us, okay? You say, man, that forgiveness thing seems crazy. Like, trusting God to promote me and not taking control of my own plans, that's crazy. Run from temptation, that's crazy, pastor. That's out of the box. How do you have the power to do that? Well, let me end with this before I pray for you. Joseph is a type of Jesus. Their names are actually spelled very similar as you look at it. There's a type and a shadow here that the Bible's painting for us. Have you ever thought about Joseph's story that I just told you? Well, think about Jesus. Jesus was loved by his father. He was favored by his father. He was unjustly accused. He was unjustly thrown in prison. He was sold for silver. But his life, he said on the cross, it is finished. Jesus finished his race. And because he did, just like Joseph, what the enemy meant, the enemy's like, oh, I got him now. What the enemy meant for evil resulted in the salvation of many, many lives. And if you grab a hold of that into your own life, wherever you're at today, wherever you're stuck, you can get to the next step in your race. I'm gonna pray for you today. First of all, I pray for those of you that say, I need to accept that Jesus. I need that Jesus in my heart and life. Well, you can just right where you are say, Jesus, come into my life. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. Become my Jesus. I accept you today as my personal Lord and Savior. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it and you asked Jesus into your heart, I'm gonna ask you to let us know. Maybe come forward at the end of the service, fill out a card. We're having Discovery 101. I wanna say this to every person. We're having Discovery 101 the first weekend in December. I'd love to meet you there. If Jesus is now coming into your heart and life, we wanna help you start to take steps. But I wanna pray for a second group of people. You're like, Pastor Jeff, I need to get more full of faith because I feel stuck like Joseph, maybe in a pit, maybe falsely accused, maybe held back, maybe whatever, I need to run from temptation. Would you pray for me? Would you just lift your hand up to me and just say, hey, pay, pray for me, pastor, pray for me, pray for me, thank you, just keep it up, thank you, maybe even in a video service or later watching this message. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we don't, we don't muster up our own faith. We don't stream it out of our convenient technological world, but every time we get close to you, we get more anchored to that which we can have confidence in that which we can have assurance in, your promises, your character, your nature. And Lord, I pray for every person that they may walk in feeling stuck, but they walk out more confident in what you're calling them to do. In Jesus' name, amen.